Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, my talk on transport level testing of NVMe devices using VFIO. My name is uh, Klaus. I'm a software engineer with uh, Samsung Electronics. And I, on my day-to-day -day basis, I work on open source. Uh, I'm a co-maintainer of the QEMO emulated NVMe device. And I also work uh, in various other areas of the uh, open source NVMe ecosystem. So we'll be talking about uh, VFIO today and uh, some of the core concepts that we're gonna have to go through to understand what we're gonna work with is uh, we're gonna have to go through some low level stuff in NVMe and PCI Express. Then we're talking a little bit about the uh, IO MNU and how it works and the VFIO kernel framework. And uh, we'll use this to try and write a driver in less than 30 minutes, uh, which will be able to do low level command submission to NVMe devices. And we'll also see how we can interact with uh, uh, the controller memory buffer, which is a, a PCI Express based uh, feature. So NVMe in one slide. So uh, NVMe is non-volatile memory express and it's a storage interface that's designed to exploit uh, the low latency and inherent parallelism of NAND flash memory. Now, some core terminology here is the uh, controller which is basically just a PCI Express function that acts as the interface to the host. And then there's the command queues. And the command queues are the core feature that makes NVMe tick. The host will write the submission queue entries that describe a command to a dedicated submission queue. And the controller will write completion queue entries to another dedicated uh, queue called the completion queues. So while this, uh, might be easy, we won't be able to do with one slide. We're gonna have to need uh, way more than that. Uh, because by the end of this talk, we will actually be ha having a rudimentary NVMe driver. So we will focus on core concepts, which are the queues, the submission and completion queue entries, uh, PCI doorbells and core contro controller configuration. And we will only be talking about a single NVMe command, the identify command, which, which can tell the host about various uh, stuff about the controller. Uh, which means that we will skip all other commands uh, like IO, and you can read these up in the spec or look these up in the spec uh, afterwards if you're interested. We also won't be talking about specific namespace types, the standard NVM namespace type and the zone namespace type. If you're interested in this, I suggest that you go see my talk from last year as uh, Open Source Summit. Um, which have a talk specifically on the zone namespace implementation in uh, QEMO. So let's first look at the actual submission queue entry. It's a 64 byte payload and it describes everything that the controller needs to actually execute a command. There's a lot of fields in here, uh, but we are only specifically interested in three of these uh, for, for what we'll be doing uh, in this talk. So uh, the first one is the command identifier which is a host chosen uh, unique ID for, for a command. And then we have the opcode, which together with the actual submission queue that we submit stuff to uniquely identifies the command that the uh, controller should execute. And then there's the data pointer, which describes the payload that's associated with the command. Now the uh, payload or the, the data pointer is a six, existing, 16 bytes. So, uh, but it actually consists of uh, two 64-bit memory addresses, what we call physical region pages that always point to something that are of the size of the uh, host operating system's page size. So the uh, queues that are central to NVMe are basically circular buffers that are defined by two pointers. It, there's the tail pointer, which is incremented when we add something to the queue. And then there's the head pointer, which is incremented when we are removing entries from the queue or we are reading entries from the queue. And as you can see in the uh, example figure here, we have a queue where we have three entries in it, which, and the, uh, the reader has not read any of them. So the head pointer points to the first location. And for the producer or the writer to know where to write the next entries, we have a tail point that points to the next empty uh, slot in the queue. So the queues are in that way lock free because the reader will never read past uh, the tail pointer uh, and the writer will never write past the head pointer. So the host and the controller can act both as queue readers and writers depending on the actual queue, where, for instance, 
the in, in the case of a submission queue, the host is the writer and the controller is the reader. And for completion queues, uh, the it's the other way around. So the queues are normally allocated in main system memory. And with this means that from the host point of view, writing uh, a command uh, or reading a completion uh, entry is as simple as a memory copy. So this brings us to some questions. So first thing is, again, how, how does the controller or the device actually know where to find these queues? And how do we get the device to fetch and execute these commands when we have written something to it? And how do we know if the command was uh, executed and when it would have actually executed? So uh, to configure the device and tell it different stuff, uh, the PCI device can expose a set of configuration registers. We call this the PCI configuration space. And it's mapped into, uh, into the host memory address space. This means that the uh, host can go into this address space uh, and configure the PCI device and read various stuff about the device uh, in this configuration area. Um, the device can also expose uh, memory areas to be mapped into the host address space. We call these the base address registers and they contain uh, an address which the host configures and, and, uh, and, and uh, this tells the device um, that at this location we will be reading um, we'll be reading these uh, these configuration addresses uh, configuration registers uh, that the device exposed. These are different from the PCI registers. So this is custom uh, uh, registers that are unique to the device type, say NVMe. So in in, in the case of NVMe, uh, the device will expose as uh, uh, an area of memory called the memory base address uh, register. Um, this, this memory location contains a basic controller configuration and is used for the basic controller configuration and communication between the host and, and the device. So it looks something like this when we look at it in tabular form. So there are a bunch of, uh, control, uh, of registers here. There's the controller capabilities register, which is a read-only register where the device uh, uh, can tell the, the host about various capabilities and features that it support and features that it does not support. Then there's the version register that tells it about what version of the specification are we implementing. And then there's the contr controller configuration registers where the, uh, the host can set up the device uh, in a certain way uh, with certain parameters that are needed for the device to operate. We also have these two special registers called the admin submission queue base address and admin completion queue base address. These are special uh, registers that tell the device where to fetch uh, uh, admin um, submission, uh, admin commands and where to post completion uh, entries for these commands. So now we know how to basically bootstrap the device. Uh, by configuring this config, uh, controller configuration register. Now, how do we get the device to actually fetch and execute the command? For this, we use something called a PCI doorbell. And a PCI doorbell is just a common name for a write-only memory map register. Uh, we can read from them, but, but the, the behavior of that is, is undefined. Um, so uh, from the point of view of the host, we will only be writing these registers. As you can see here, they are also located in the uh, in the M bar or the, the first bar on the device, and uh, and uh, it starts at the address uh, of uh, of uh, of the, the memory bar plus uh, 4K, so the address of uh, of 1000 in, in hex. The uh, tail doorbells are uh, four byte right, wide, and they come in two forms. They come in a tail doorbell and a head doorbell, and we shall see how these are used. So when we write this, we call it ringing the doorbell. Um, and the, the way we do this is that when the host ha has written one or more entries to the submission queue, we sort of can, can kick the device and tell it, now you need to start executing stuff. We do this by writing the new value of the uh, tail pointer um, to, to this, uh, to this uh, register. So we can see here that it's basically just a write to a memory location at a certain offset with a certain value. So the value tells the device that 
I have uh, inserted uh, entries up to this point in the queue, and you may now fetch them from your previously uh, head position. This, in this case, this tells the device that it can uh, execute and fetch and execute uh, entries uh, zero, one, and two. So, but what happens when the queue is full? In this case, that's when the host has produced uh, enough uh, uh, submission queue entries that the tail pointer goes to seven in this case, and there's no more room in, in the queue. Um, when that happens, the controllers somehow have to notify the, the, the host that it has executed these commands and that the host may reuse the slots in the queue. Note, note also that is the responsibility of the host not to override the uh, non-fetched entries in the, in the queue. But to understand this, we have to look at how uh, NVMe piggybacks this information in, uh, in completion queue entries. So specifically, how do we know if a command was executed? To do that, we use the completion queue entries. And these are posted or written by the uh, controller whenever it has finished executing a command. Uh, the completion queue entry is 16 bytes, so it's smaller, uh, but it contains just enough information for the, uh, for the host to, to know about the status of the command. Was it a success? Did the controller encounter some kind of error? Did, maybe it didn't understand the uh, maybe didn't understand the command, the opcode that we requested, or maybe we encountered a memory error, something like that. It will always add the complete command identifier, which is used by the host to know uh, what command this relates to. It also includes the identification of the completion of, of the submission queue that we originally uh, submitted this identifier to. And uh, it also includes a new value of the head pointer. That is, this is the value, um, uh, or this is the new value of the internally maintained head pointer in the controller, which tells the host that I have now uh, executed these commands, so you may reuse the slots. To see this in action when the controller piggybacks something and, and gives a new uh, head pointer location of four, then the, the host will know that it can now reuse entries 0, 1, 2, and 3 uh, for new commands. So how do we know that when these commands are executed or have been executed? So since there's no doorbell register that can be ringed on the host uh, to inform it that completion queue uh, contains entries, we have two options. So the host can choose to simply keep reading uh, the uh, memory location of the, uh, of the completion queue and wait for something called a phase change. This is a polling technique. We can also rely on interrupts that are maybe generated by controller or a combination of these two things. So let's first look, look at what polling means and what, what it means to look for a phase change. So there's a special bit in the uh, completion queue entry called the phase bit. And the phase bit is inverted uh, by the controller whenever it writes or overwrites an existing entry uh, in the completion queue. So when we begin uh, operation with a completely empty queue, the phase bit is zero. And the, the host may, may keep, reading, uh, keep reading this uh, memory location, the, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the tail, and, and keep reading it until the phase bit changes. So when the host writes something, it inverts this phase bit, goes to one. The, the host will immediately no, notice this, and then it knows that this is a new entry. And then it will advance the, the uh, tail position, and it will check the next entry. If the entry uh, or the phase bit is changed again, then we know that this is not a new entry, and we stop uh, polling, or we, we, uh, uh, or we wait for another, another entry. So while polling allows very low latency, it usually comes at the cost of dedicating an entire call to keep doing this uh, constantly. So another way to do this is to rely on interrupts, and it is the standard way of working with NVMe devices. So in, in an interrupt-based system, we uh, rely on the controller to generate an interrupt, which basically says that something's up, because the interrupt doesn't carry any information other than something's up, you need to take action. Now, depending on the configuration and depending on the capabilities of the device, uh, 
the interrupt may indicate that there is new stuff in a specific completion queue, or it may just indicate that there's new stuff in some completion queue. So we still use the face bit because when we get this uh, interrupt, we don't know how many completion queue entries the queue holds. So we still keep reading the completion queue until we see the face change in the bit uh, in the face bit once again. So finally, we need some way for the controller or the host to actually indicate to the controller that it has read this completion queue entry and that the controller may uh, reuse this slot in the completion queue because the controller is under the same restrictions that it cannot override uh, the entries until they are acknowledged by the, the host. So we do with this with another doorbell. We call this the head doorbell, and it's also registered in in, in the bar. And uh, basically, what happens is that we we tell the device the new location of our of our of the head pointer, the maintained head pointer. And uh, but but notice that the entry is not uh, zeroed or cleared in the memory. It remains in place, which means that the face bit value remains in place. So at the next point, when we go around through the circular queue and we come to this position, then the controller will again invert the face bit and we know it's a new entry. So that's basically it for the low level NVMe stuff that we're gonna need. Um, now in part two, we'll look at the VFIO, uh, IOMU, and how to actually use this and try to do these steps manually uh, on a device. Okay, so uh, what we've been going through right now is basically what the kernel driver or the user space framework does for you. So you don't need to worry about these details to do amazing stuff with an NVMe device. You can use the block layer abstractions of your operating system coupled with a high performance asynchronous programming model like raw IO Uring or a slightly higher framework like XNVMe. Or you can use a uh, user-based framework such as SPDK for, for even more control. But neither XNVMe in, in its pass-through mode or SPDK allows manipulation at the actual transport level. Now, all the abstractions of these frameworks are at the command level, which means that if you look at the API, the SPDK uh, lowest level uh, 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 commands is about writing a command uh, an admin command or an IO command, and it's about simply waiting and processing the completions. This is similar in XNVMe where you can uh, pass through a command uh, to the device and you can wait and you can, can, can look at the completion queue. So this means that there's no manipulation of the queues directly. And one of the things is that uh, both XNVMe and SPDK relies on a, a a concept where we always have a one-to-one -one correspondence between submission queues and completion queue. Uh, NVMe actually supports that multiple submission queues can result in completion queue entries going to one uh, completion queue. So you can have a, a one, a, a many-to-one relationship between submission queues and completion queues. This is not supported by any of these frameworks. You also have no specific control of the I interrupt vector configuration. So you will always, uh, I, I, I believe that the uh, SPDK will try to attach, uh, SPDK actually doesn't use interrupt vectors, it uses polling on, on all of the queues, but you cannot set up a, a set of completion queues to use one uh, interrupt vector or another set to use one vector each and stuff like that. And you basically also have no low level controller configuration uh, uh, abilities uh, at all in these frameworks. So this makes them a little less uh, suitable to, for doing a really low level um, uh, inspection of your devices and testing of your devices and the code paths in your device. So if we wanted to actually do some of the stuff with, that we've learned in part one, how, how would we go about doing this? So we could go to uh, the, the standard NVMe kernel driver in Linux and we could modify it to do some custom stuff. We could add a custom IOCTL to do uh, a specific test uh, and stuff like that. Or we could simply disable all security features of the kernel and just go completely crazy as, as, as root. And we could do this through the, the IOU PCI generic driver. Or we could actually utilize the uh, virtual functions IO framework to do 
this kind of custom stuff, but in a very safe way. So how low can we actually go? So the problem is that interacting with devices at the level of the registers has traditionally been a job that is uh, for the kernel to do. It's a very privileged uh, activity reserved for kernel and kernel hackers, but the virtual function IO framework actually sort of changes this, at least sort of. So VFIO is a driver framework in itself, and the VFIO PCI is a driver that the PCI devices will attach to or be bound to instead of the normal driver like in EMU. Now, the point here is that we retain, the kernel retains authority over the device. It's still the, in charge of the device. It still protects the device from user space. Um, but the, the driver, the VFIO PCI driver, provides full access to this device from user space, uh, which means that we can actually uh, read and write from the PCI configuration space, and we can read and write to the bars. And it, it gives us very fine-grained interrupt control uh, to configure it as uh, for pin-based, legacy pin-based interrupts or MSI and MSIX uh, uh, configurations. Now, it all relies on IOMU-based DMA translations, which allows uh, the driver to limit what the user can actually program the device to do to, to make it safe. And it also confines this DMA to uh, the DMA of the device to the address space of the user space process. This is essential since uh, traditionally the IO devices have been working with physical addresses such that you could, uh, you could basically instruct the device to perform a DMA into another physical address which may belong to another process or something like that. But the IO MMU provides a translation uh, between uh, the IO devices and the CPU. It basically does what we call, it, it adds something called IO virtual addresses, which are sort of like virtual addresses, a virtual address space, but for the IO devices that match to physical devices that can then go into the system memory. So it's basically just what the memory management unit does for, virt for regular virtual memory uh, when the CPU is operating. So, and as we can see here in the, in, in, in the diagram, you have a bunch of IO devices behind this IO MMU and they will work with IO virtual addresses. Now we can actually have multiple uh, IO devices behind the IO MMU. And in this case, the IO devices can technically, uh, depending on, on, on how the motherboard or how it is actually wired up, these devices may actually be able to interact with each other. So we can still have one device that could uh, read or write to, to, to the other device uh, through DMA. So uh, the VFIO framework uh, and the IO MMU framework in, in the kernel uh, has the concept of an IOMU group, which is basically the, 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 the lowest uh, granularity on which we can ensure uh, safety. So for a perfectly isolated uh, IO device, it needs to be in a singular group with no other IO devices. Otherwise, we need to accept that uh, the, the security or the isolation granularity is at the level of the group um, mark here. So to, to work with VFIO, there's a lot of boilerplate involved. So um, VFI works with something, a concept called a container. And when the first thing that you have to do when you start working with VFIO is, is to create this container, and then you can verify the VFIO capabilities, like what's the API version supported by the kernel? Uh, is, there an, is there actually an IO MMU that we can use? Uh, then we have to determine the group of the device, the IO or the VFIO MMU, uh, IO MMU group. And we need to verify that this group is viable. And what viable means is that each of the devices in the group has to be either uh, not bound to any driver or at least everyone, all of them bound to, to the VFIO PCI driver. So when the group is determined to be viable, we can add it to the container. And the cool thing here is that since we are, since we, we can ensure that different groups, interaction between different groups will always go through the MM and IO MMU, we can add more groups uh, to the same container and work with all of them independently. Um, when all of this is done, we can enable the IO MMU and we can retrieve a list of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the ranges uh, that the IO uh, virtual addresses can have and that we can use. And then finally, we can actually open the device, we get a device handle, which is a file descriptor, and we can start configuring it. That means we can set up the memory regions, the 
TCI configuration space, uh, any bars that we're interested in, and we can configure the interrupts on the device. So the API or the user uh, space API from the kernel is uh, very minimal, uh, but also extremely extensible for, for future uh, features and capabilities. It looks something like this when you work with it raw, which means that it's a bunch of ioctal calls. Uh, for instance, this, we have an example here where we just query the group for, for, for the status of the group and we can check if it's viable. Um, then there's an example here of how to set up interrupts. As you can see, you set up a data structure uh, of a certain size, you set up a bunch of fields. You, uh, but what you do here is that you, you set up uh, the exact way that the, um, that the uh, interrupt should be, uh, should be configured. And then you issue another IOCTL to actually configure this for the device. Now, as you can see, all of this is, is, is agnostic to, to PCI. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's an abstraction on the device uh, which used this common framework. So uh, there is a pretty good documentation on the kernel website on, for, for the actual uh, VFIO framework, but there's also a lot of good code in the QEMO uh, source code. Uh, the QEMO source code has extensive support for uh, device pass-through. This means uh, unbound, you know, uh, unbinding a device uh, on the host and basically binding it uh, or passing it through to the virtual uh, machine. And what happens here is that basically the virtual machine or the hypervisor becomes a user space uh, driver that manages the device and passes it through to the uh, guest operating system. This is done by the uh, uh, VFIO uh, subsystem in QEMO. QEMO also has an NVMe driver for, for, for using raw NVMe devices as, uh, as block storage. Uh, and this is VFIO based, so there's a lot of good stuff in there. The VFIO helpers, uh, we call it a library, but the but, uh, but, um, object in, in QEMO contains a bunch of various, uh, very nice helpers to actually work with this. Uh, so in general, in QEMO, there is a, a bunch of great code to, to learn from and, and to look through to actually understand better how this works uh, very deep. So, but one thing that, that we don't have is that there's no lib VFIO. There's no user space, uh, there's no library available that actually tries to unify all of these best practices that are especially uh, um, uh, in QEMO code and, and all these utility functions. Um, there's no library that does this. So I, I've been working on a, a library called, uh, so far just called uh, uh, VFIO in my, my local repository. And it's a set of utility libraries uh, written in C to work with the uh, VFIO user library, uh, user API. The library uh, contains uh, functions to do the basic VFIO device initialization or the spoiler plate code. And it includes uh, extremely simple, naive, and, and, uh, and what is called fixed IO VA allocator. Uh, it just helps you allocate IO virtual addresses, but you cannot free them. You can just allocate a new one, and then the allocator just makes sure that you don't reuse these uh, virtual addresses. So in some sense, while this can, can give you unused virtual uh, IO virtual addresses, you still have to manage them yourself. Uh, but, but it's a plugin based, so you can add another allocator of your own writing uh, if you want a more advanced allocator. Then there's a bunch of uh, utility functions, uh, functions for doing portable IO, uh, Indianness, uh, uh, correct IO. Uh, that's uh, support for or utility functions for setting up the interrupt configuration. And that's utility functions for doing uh, DMA mapping uh, of, of, uh, of memory. So all of the boilerplate platey stuff uh, that that we uh, that I talked about previously can basically be done in one single uh, uh, one single API call here. It's called the VFIO PCI init, uh, and it will initialize a PCI uh, VFIO PCI state uh, from a PCI ID. And then there's another call to to configure the uh, the IRQ, uh, basically setting up a, a, a Linux kernel event uh, uh, file descriptor. Uh, and, and match it to a specific uh, interrupt vector on the device. Now, this is all intended to be open sourced. I'm, I'm still working on it, but, but uh, my intention is to open source it uh, no later than, uh, than Q3 this year. So 
Besides just basic VFIO functionality, it also includes a bunch of NVMe specific functionality because that's what I'm working on. Um, it, it provides a bunch of utility functions for this, like enabling uh, or initializing the controller, uh, resetting the controller, enabling the controller, and creating IOQ pairs to do actual IO. So it also has very low level uh, command submission. So it, the, the, the core API is at the level of, of posting a command to the, to the com, uh, submission queue. It's at the level of uh, kicking the device, uh, writing the doorbell, um, uh, ringing the doorbell with the kick call. Uh, there's a peak call, which allows you to, to peek at the, at, the, at, the, at the top entry in the, uh, in the, um, in the completion queue. And then there's acknowledgement function that allows you to acknowledge all uh, uh, entries in the uh, in the completion queue. It also has some some mid-level convenience functions such as the post kick wait acknowledge combined command that basically allows you to synchronously submit a command and wait for its completion, while giving you a, a reference to the uh, completion queue entry. So when we go about how to try and, and, and emulate all this stuff, what we can do is that we can try to use QEMO, which is a, a super nice uh, a platform to experiment with this kind of stuff because we need an IOMMU. Most platforms, most workstations already have this, but it's nice to be able to work in a virtual environment. So setting this up requires you to configure QEMO with the Q35 machine type, and you need to enable the kernel IOQ chip to be uh, split. Or, or completely user space uh, driven. And then you need to add the Intel IMMU device, uh, the virtual IMMU. And then as usual, you add your NVMe uh, controller and you add a namespace to it. And uh, then you set up your regular boot drives, configure the CPU type, uh, amount of memory and, and so on, network and so on. So when you have all this up and running, uh, the first thing you do with the uh, with the library is initialize the uh, device uh, at a at the PCI level. You do this with the uh, VFIO PCI init call, and then uh, at that point we can now map the controller registers. So in this case, we're interested in mapping the uh, the M bar or the bar the first bar bar zero that we uh, talked about previously. Uh, we're mapping. Uh, the, the controller registers and the doorbells separately, as you can see here, we're mapping the first uh, bar zero, uh, we're mapping the first 4K of bar zero, which is the controller registers, and then we're mapping the doorbells, which are the next uh, 4K, um, next 4K uh, uh, bytes on, on, uh, on the bar. When, when we have this mapped, we can basically reset the device, which means that we write a certain value to the uh, controller configuration register and the device resets and, and is ready for use. Then we can allocate some memory. Uh, we use uh, regular virtual memory using the mem map, which guarantees that we get a nice uh, page aligned uh, set of memory. Uh, then we assign some IO virtual address. This is something we choose because we control the, uh, the mapping. So in this case, we just choose the null address. It is a valid address. And this actually found a bug in, in the QEMO emulating the device because it didn't actually accept the, uh, the address of zero for, for say the, the admin queue or stuff like that. But the, the, the zero address is a valid address, hard address, so no problem there. Then we call the VFIO DMA map function, which maps the virtual address to the uh, IO virtual address. And uh, from there on, we can use the IO virtual address uh, in commands to the device. So what we need to do, as we learned, was to set up or bootstrap the device with the admin queues. So we assign two uh, IO virtual addresses, address zero and address 1000 here. We memory map uh, space for the, uh, for the admin queues, and then we map them. The next thing we do is that we uh, tell the device about the size of these, uh, these queues. We do that right into the admin queue attributes register. And then we inform the controller about the actual address of the, uh, of the, of the queues through the admin submission queue address uh, register and the admin completion queue address register. Then we set up an event uh, file descriptor and we assign that 
to uh, interrupt uh, vector zero, which always corresponds to the admin queue. When all of that is done, you can enable the controller, which writes the configuration uh, register, the CC register. And from here on out, the controller is ready to use. So let's try to execute an identify command and get some information about the, the device. Again, we allocate some memory of a certain size. In this case, the identified data structure given uh, returned by the device is, is 4K in size, so we allocate that. Again, we choose an arbitrary virtual address. We can choose that ourselves, so we can use the allocator from the library, and then we map that address. Then we set up our command. Uh, we need to have a data structure uh, available that actually maps to the, um, to the uh, submission queue entry that we saw in the beginning of the talk. And we set it up. We, we set the opcode, which identifies the command to be executed. We uh, choose our controller or uh, uh, a command ID. And then we set up the, uh, the data pointer. In this case, we just use uh, the first address in the data pointer and set that to the uh, assigned IO virtual address. And then specifically for the identify command, there's a field called the controller namespace uh, selection, which chooses the sub uh, command. In this case, we are asking the device for information about general information about the controller. So to write the command, uh, we simply use a memcopy as we discussed. We write it to the virtual address, uh, the, the address space that we see as, as, the, pro as, a, as a user space process. And we write it at the current tail of the submission queue address um, and at the size of the command. Then we update the tail pointer and we take care of the wraparound because it's a circular queue. And then the final thing we do is that we write the doorbell and we use the utility function again here to uh, do a memory map IO write of 32 bits to the doorbell uh, uh, address and writing the new tail uh, value. So, when this happens, the controller will pick up the, the, the command and it will execute it and it will generate an interrupt when it's done. So to do that, we simply read from the uh, event file descriptor, which is a blocking uh, file uh, IO. So we will block here until it's actually, uh, until we get the interrupt. And as soon as we have the interrupt, then we can read the completions. What this means is that we start reading the completion queue, uh, the admin completion queue uh, at the current head position and then we wait for this phase bit, or we accept, you know, we, we expect a, a phase bit change here. Uh, when we read that, we constantly increase the head pointer uh, value we, that we maintain internally. And when the phase bit changes again, we know that we're done. So the final thing we do is that we inform the controller that we have acknowledged that we have read the completion queue entry, and we write that back to the completion queue head uh, doorbell. So let's look at this. Uh, with an actual demo of how this works. So here I've uh, booted up a virtual machine like I described previously. And uh, over here we have the uh, trace log output of, uh, of QEMO that allows us to see what is actually going on on the emulated MUE device. Over here I have my uh, deep, uh, VFIO. And the first thing that we'll do is that we'll check that we actually have devices. And as we can see here, we, we have a, a NVMe controller device, a QEMO emulated NVMe uh, device, which uh, currently contains two namespaces. And we're not really clear about that right now. So if we look at the LSPCI, we'll see that we have the, uh, the controller here. Um, and the first thing that we do is that we unbind uh, the device from the NVMe uh, from the NVMe driver, and we bind it to the uh, VFIO PCI driver. So uh, as we can see here, VFIO uh, loads up. And what actually happens is that the, 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 the controller is, is shut down, and it's in a sort of a clean state. Uh, we don't know this for sure, but in this case, that's the, the kernel nicely shuts down the device as we uh, unbind it. So the next thing we can do now is we can try to run this identify example. And just to see uh, the actual code here, we can see that the, what the identifier is supposed to do is to, to initialize the PCI device. It will write out some stuff from the registers. In this case, it will write out the version of the device. We will map some memory, use the allocator to, to reserve uh, an IOVA. Uh, we'll map that virtual address. Then we'll set up uh, uh, the, uh, the identify command. 
And then we'll use this convenience function to post, kick, wait, and acknowledge uh, the command. Finally, when uh, the command has been executed, we're gonna see what the device actually responded to us and, and print out uh, something from it. In this case, we're gonna print out the uh, vendor ID of the device. So running this, we see that uh, we get a bunch of debug information. Um, but over here in the trace is actually what's most interesting. So what we see here is that we see the, the, the library configuring a device. It's specifically, it's configuring the, uh, the admin uh, completion queue and, and admin submission queue addresses. And finally, it's enabling the controller. And does some other stuff here that just uh, is part of the initialization. But finally, here we see that uh, the um, that the uh, that the host or the the, uh, the application we have here is uh, writing the submission queue doorbell, and it's uh, uh, the the host or the controller picks this up. Uh, Notice that is an identify command. It it. Uh, it executes the identify command, it maps the address uh, that we have assigned, in this case, uh, uh, address 2000, and it writes uh, stuff back into this, and then it enqueues a completion uh, and raising an interrupt on vector zero. And when, uh, the, con when, the, uh, when, the, uh, when the application here has uh, read that completion queue entry, it again writes the completion queue uh, doorbell with with the new value of the head pointer. So we see here uh, that we could read the register and get the uh, actual uh, specification implemented by the controller. And we also read out the, uh, the uh, vendor ID of the device. Okay, now, so let's do uh, some bit more tricky stuff. So higher end NVMe devices support something called the controller memory buffer. It's basically a region of uh, general purpose read write memory that is located on the device and it is ex exposed through a bar. It might be a, an exclusive bar that means it's at uh, offset zero or it can be at an offset into a, a memory location uh, exposed through a bar. There are two address spaces for this area. There's the PCI Express uh, address range, which is basically like physical addresses, and then there's uh, or, or IOVA addresses, and then there's controller virtual uh, controller address range. Now the uh, the area because it's on a bar can be mapped like any other bar. In this case, we know that it's a 16 kilobyte uh, controller memory buffer. It's located on bar two at offset zero. So we map the bar like we would map uh, the M bar, uh, and we get a, a pointer to this virtual memory. So we can write it uh, through the PCI Express address range by simply writing directly to the pointer with a mem copy or uh, typecasting and write it directly into it. We can also instruct the controller to uh, carry uh, to execute a command and then post uh, and then write the result of that command into the controller memory buffer instead of writing it into the uh, in, into host memory. We do this by uh, setting up uh, like a, a virtual virtual address for the controller. This is what we call a controller based address. And this address is only visible by the controller. So this is not an address that's backed by physical memory or something like that. It's only available inside the controller. And the controller uses this address to know if it's supposed to be doing a DMA operation or writing into its own internal memory. So we simply choose something. In this case, we can choose the maximum IOVA address. So we know for sure that we're not using an address that might be used for DMA. So in this case, we can use the max IOVA uh, address. We can add one and we can align it to the page size. Then what we do is write a certain register on the device called the CMB memory space configuration register. And we write this address into that register and we enable it by setting the two lower bits to, to one in this case. Then we again uh, set up the identify command, but in this, uh, in this case, the, 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 the memory pointer that we ask the device to write the result into is this controller base address, which doesn't have any backing in, 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 in actual memory on the host. And then we use our convenience function to uh, post, kick, wait, and acknowledge the command.
Now, when we have written this into the controller memory at, uh, controller memory buffer, we can read out the data again. We could either ask the controller to, to read it from the uh, um, to read it from the memory, but we can also like uh, just use our virtual address reference to read directly on the device and ask the kernel to perform the memory map, map IO for us. So in this case, we just take the uh, address of the controller memory buffer, we typecast it to a uh, identify controller data structure, and then we can simply uh, access the fields as we would any other uh, data structure. So let's see this in action. So back in our demo setup now, uh, we're gonna be uh, using this example program called CMB. And uh, as I showed in the, in the previous slides, uh, the, the, the only particular different thing we're gonna be doing here is that we're gonna be mapping this address. We, use a, we, we look into a bunch of other registers on the device to, uh, to get information about the size of the controller memory buffer. That's what we do here. We, we read some, some specific registers that defines the size. Um, and and it gives us a and we also can get the physical address of the actual uh, device, um, or the actual uh, uh, the bar, um, which we won't be using. But but uh, but it's nice to 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 know what it is here in this example. And then we we map the CMB. We uh, simply uh, assign a, a controller uh, uh, base address. Uh, we write out what the result of that is. We inform it, uh, the controller-based address to the controller. Then we execute the command, and then we write out uh, the version field of, uh, of the result of that identify command. So running the example, um, we'll see here that the uh, controller uh, setup here, or what we're doing here is that we're setting up the, this is all this stuff, where we're actually setting up the, uh, the, the CMB. Um, we see here that it's, as a, it's located on a physical address. This is the physical address that the operating system has assigned to the bar. And, but we won't be using that because we, uh, we're not interested in using the physical address. So instead, we assign the controller uh, base address and we just choose something. Uh, in this case, we choose something that, that's uh, this address plus one. Um, the, the last IOVA range available. And then we uh, carry out the command and then we can write out uh, the version field, which tells us that it's, yes, this is uh, specification version 1.4. Okay, so uh, rounding up on my talk, uh, there are some key takeaways here I, I wanted to, uh, to highlight. And I think uh, the key thing here is that you can actually write a driver. Like uh, you don't have to be a kernel hacker or a kernel expert to, uh, to write a PCI uh, driver. You, with a relatively brief overview of uh, the device specification, you can do this driver stuff uh, from user space. And as, as, as we've seen, even with going through the theory, you actually wrote a very simple driver that can execute commands uh, 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 compliant uh, with the specification in, in less than 45 minutes. But I also think that, that one of this, what this shows is that we need some kind of lib VFIO. Uh, I think it would be nice that we had something uh, that we could all use, uh, that the community would maintain. So I'll be open sourcing this as a start, uh, and then we'll see where we go from there. Um, I'm very happy to collaborate on this uh, if anyone else is interested on interested in, in, in trying to, to get something like this up and running. So I'm going to say uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for attending my talk. I, I hope you enjoyed it. And um, if you have any questions, I'm available for Q&A, uh, both on email, but also after the talk. Uh, thanks again. Goodbye.